You're listening to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life, a podcast about living with more joy, energy, and flow. We strive to help you create a healthier life from a wide variety of perspectives. We want you to glean some useful nuggets from each episode to help you be more in the flow with ease, joy, and purpose. So if you feel your life could be more fulfilling, healthy, and joyful, you're in the right place. Welcome. You're listening to Keeping It Real with Janine, Episode 10, the Herbal First Aid Kit with Krista Poulton, our medical herbalist. Krista shares a plethora of natural healing remedies you can use in your daily life, even if you aren't interested in a first aid kit. So be prepared to take some notes and enjoy. Hey everyone, it is time for another check-in with our medical herbalist, Krista Poulton. Hey Krista, are you there? I am here, Jeannie. Nice to be speaking with you today. Oh, it's great to be speaking with you, too. I always enjoy our conversations. Uh, What would you like to share with us today? Well, I was thinking about um, uh, kind of discussing a little bit today about a herbal first aid kit. Um, I like to teach uh, the community that I live in and my students about things they can do at home if they've got cuts or scrapes or burns. And we're coming into that season where people are going to be getting outside a little bit more post winter. And it's always a good idea to get your herbal first aid kit ready for the summer. I think that's an awesome idea. Thank you so much for thinking of it. Let's get right into it. Great. Absolutely. So with a herbal first aid, could you have any questions about a herbal first aid kit first? Well, um, now is this in an in, in adjunct to what someone would normally have in a, a reg, I don't know what, how, what to call it, a regular first aid kit? Or is this something you'd have separate? Um, usually I have them together. So when I'm, uh, for me, when I make my herbal first aid kit, it's, uh, it's very much because I do a lot of outdoor activities. So I do lots of hiking, I wild harvest quite a bit. And so um, I always have a, a herbal first aid kit for those times when I'm out in the forest and something happens, like I cut myself. Um, and I also know how to uh, like wild identify um, plants that I can be using on topically if I do have any kind of injuries while I'm out. But it's always a good idea to have a herbal first aid kit around the house as well. I use mine mostly for when I'm out um, kind of doing more adventurous type activities, but I, I absolutely use mine at home as well. Okay, well, why don't you start with, let's do a list of what you would have in your kit. I'm going to actually take notes while you're doing that and put the list on um, on the website. And then you can go into um, uh, the the details of how you'd put it together and what you'd make or, you know, whatever it was you wanted to share with us on that. Great. Absolutely. So there's definitely a few different types of herbal preparations that I always like to include. Um, And we've talked about some making these um, herbal preparations in previous um, chats together. Um, So one of the things I always like to carry around is salves. And I prefer carrying around a salve, which is just an oil and beeswax mixture instead of a cream, um, because a salve is a little bit more Hmm, let's say heat variable stable. So it can get a little bit more of a fluctuation between hot and cold. So if you are like myself and are out hiking, um, it's going to be warm during the day, cold while I'm camping. And so I find that salves, which is again, just an oil and a beeswax base, um, tend to be a little bit more shelf stable compared to a cream doesn't really like to be heated and cooled too often. So Mm -hmm. I really like carrying salves and it's, you know, a lot for topical use. So for cuts and wounds, um, you can use it almost like, um, um, you know, you can do like a thin layer, you can do uh, a thick layer versus a cream. You really can only do a small thin layer. So I like using salves. Sometimes I'll put them like, if it's a deep wound, I'll put a large, um, kind of like a, more goopy layer on. And then sometimes I do a a thinner layer. So it just depends on what the application. So I find that salves are more versatile than creams. Mm -hmm. So what would you, so what would, what uh, salves would you be putting in your kit? What, what herbals? Yeah. Some of my salves that I like to have. So some of my 
the simple sad. So a simple sad means just one herb infused in the oil and then beeswax is mixed in. And so I like to carry a lot of simple salves because I can mix salves together on site. So mm, um, mm-hmm. if I have various things going on, I can mix a couple salves together in my palm and my hand versus if you have a combination salve, potentially um, one of the herbs might be contraindicated for that person or it might be contraindicated for that condition. Got it. Um, so some of my simple salves is comfrey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Comfrey is um, really great for bruises and sprains. It's really great for healing uh, bones and healing um, like kind of small um, wounds. It heals really, really, really well. That we want to be a bit careful that we're not putting it on deep wounds because it can heal too fast the top layer and can create almost like an abscess underneath the healing so while it looks like the tissue has healed fully what's happened is the top layer that's closest to the outside um, of the world so our skin layer the very top layer is going to heal first but if you have a deep wound there's going to be further damage further down in the skin layer Mm -hmm. and that might not have healed properly right so is one of these where I like to always keep it as a simple because in some cases it's appropriate and some cases it's not. So really great for small um, cuts and scrapes, really great for bruising and sprains, but it's not the best for a deeper wound. Got it. Now, are you using um, the root and the leaf or one or the other? Uh, I'm typically using the leaf. Um, I do use the root in my practice, but I typically just use the leaf when I'm doing it topical. Okay. All right. Now, what? so let's delve into wounds a little bit. What do you recommend for deep wounds then? Uh, so for deep wounds, I recommend a calendula salve. So that's going to be, um, it's a type of, we call it in the common name, we call it marigold, mm-hmm. but it's not appropriate to really call it marigold because we have a different type of marigold that we uh, grow in our gardens to uh, detract insects and things like that and mm-hmm. pests into our garden and that one's not medicinal that one's actually toxic and that's called the french pot marigold and so this other type of marigold we actually prefer to refer, refer to it by its latin name calendula officinalis so we often call it calendula and that's a really great one for any type of wounds it's the safest one that we can be using and it heals more like a zipper so we go right from the base of the cut all the way up Great, great. Have you ever um, used geranium oil? I haven't used geranium oil. No, I don't do a lot of essential oils in my practice, but I tell me about it. Well, um, when I make a, a salve for deep wounds, or actually I've just put it in deep wounds, geranium oil it speeds up granulation of new tissue. And uh, I it was I can't remember now what the percentage is, but it was a pretty high percentage. Um, so geranium oil is really good for that too. And when I used to be a visiting nurse, um, this is something that most people have around, white sugar. White sugar oh, I- in a deep wound will help granulation. I used to use that for decubitus ulcers on my patients. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, there's a history about using sugar first for medicine. So we actually didn't use it in like as an edible sweet kind of treat um, until we started using it um, kind of in apothecary. So all kind of herbal medicine um, pharmacy type settings. And they started to coat almonds with this type of sugar. Um, and that's the first time it was used as a culinary compared to medicine. So mm-hmm. sugar medicine. And, and I do use honey. So I love using honey as a topical. So I will bring honey with me as well. Um, really great for any kind of wounds, uh, burns. It has antimicrobial. It has so many great benefits, enzymes and minerals and, you know, such a great, um, so much goodness in honey that I love using it topical. I do too. I, I have a jar of Manuka honey. It's a special honey from New Zealand that has, um, for some reason, it has a much larger percentage of the antimicrobial, antibacterial properties. And um, I keep that just for, uh, like if I have a sore throat or I'll use it on wounds or on skin problems, I don't use it for anything else. It's kind of expensive, but if you just use it for, um, for medicinal purposes, it lasts for a very, very long time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so another one of my favorite salves that I like to always have on hand, this is my favorite salve. Mm-hmm. And I 
never make enough to sell. I, I go through so much of the savvy year and it's cottonwood salve. So it's from um, the black cottonwood and it is a beautiful salve. So it's uh, really strongly antimicrobial. I actually had cottonwoods growing up on my farm. And uh-huh. so for me, smell just reminds me so much of my farm, that kind of sensory smell just takes me back to living on my farm and um, obviously the really good experiences of that um, those days. And so for me, I love it just for that connection. But it's also a really great versatile salve to carry with you because it's so strongly antimicrobial. Mm-hmm. So are there any specific instances where you would prefer cottonwood over anything else? To be honest, I carry cottonwood always with me, so I use it in in every circumstance. Um, but then the marigold, the comfrey, um, I also bring around uh, arnica salve. I'll always carry mm-hmm. that. As well. mm-hmm. um, and those four are my my favorite salves to carry around. But arnica you can't use on open wounds. So right. there's, I feel like comfrey and arnica they have a little bit more of a contraindication about using at all applications. So comfrey you can't uh, use on really deep wounds. Arnica, you can't use on open wounds versus cottonwood. I just find it's such a versatile and it's a stronger antimicrobial compared to the marigold. So the calendula, uh, but calendula is a more of a tissue healer. So it's a term we call vulnerary. So t- it heals the tissue and it's really safe for all ages. I have, um, I use calendula on babies. I'll make an oil um, for diaper rash and cradle cap and for, for the mamas, for the tender nipples, for breastfeeding. Um, but my favorite is definitely that cottonwood salve. It just, I love the smell of it, and it's such a great versatile salve. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That is one salve I've never made. That's that's pretty cool. Black. So it, and it's black cottonwood. Is that different? Are there different kinds of cottonwoods? Uh, yeah, there's going to be different types of cottonwood. So the one that I get is from Populus balsamifera. Um, but it's really, you can, you know, we're looking for the resins in the bud before it opens. Um, so it's actually the leaf bud before the leaf opens is what we're going for. And it's really sticky. So it's full of resins and these resins get extracted in oil and high percentage alcohol, and they're going to be strongly antimicrobial. So, you know, you can probably use other types of poplar, uh, cottonwood species. Um, as long as they have that really high quality resin that comes out. So when you harvest it, it's really, really sticky. I actually have a jar that I harvest my cottonwood in. That's a very, it's a specific cottonwood jar because it's, it is resined all on the inside. <laughs> and then I have an oil jar that I make all my oils in and a tincture one. So I have everything separate for making cottonwood because it destroys the jar. So you never get it clean again. So you should just keep one jar as your cottonwood making jar. <laughs> cottonwood making medicine. <laughs> Great. Okay. So you're using, you're using the, the bud, which has got a lot of sticky resin on it, uh, before it opens. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's going to be, at least on the Vancouver Island, I usually go in around this time. It's been a bit colder than we normally have on the island. So I'm going to go, um, probably in the next, uh, week or two and go harvest my, my cottonwood. So I haven't gone to see how big the buds are, but they, um, they're usually coming out around this time. So usually February, March, um, when I harvested it in, um, I saw, I go in Saskatchewan, I would kind of go at the end of kind of winter, early spring, but you're still, you're out when the snow is there. So you're out harvesting when there's snow. Okay, great. And I think what I'm going to do is have you email me the Latin name so that um, if people, I'll, I'll put it on the on the website, so that if people want to look it up so that they can identify the proper, the, the proper tree to get it from? Yeah, absolutely. I can, I have some handouts that I can send you so I can get uh, those together for you. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay, let's keep going. Good. All right. So some other salve combinations that I really like to have. So those ones were just the simple salves and that's usually what I carry. Um, But it is nice to sometimes have blends together. So you could do a blend of like different types of herbs for skin healing. Um, So some of those would be calendula. St. John's where it's a really amazing herb topically. It's one of my favorites. It goes red in the oil. Um, Chickweed is really great because it's going to help with any kind of itching. So if there's any type of eczema or psoriasis where there's quite a bit of itching, uh, chickweed is going to be a really great herb for that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, then vitamin E. So vitamin E is a really great um, preservative to add into our salves. So it's going to help with the oxidation of the oils that we're using to make our salves. But it's also a great skin healer in itself. So it really helps with the rejuvenation um, and regeneration of skin tissue. Okay, awesome. So uh, it, just to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, so a blend, a salve blend that, that is really good for skin issues, we'll say, would be uh, calendula, St. John's wort, chickweed, and vitamin E. Yeah, that's a really great one. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, and would you use about equal? Um, yeah, I probably would just do equal parts. Um, usually when I'm making all of my salves, I do, um, I'll make all of my oils separately and then mix them together. Mm -hmm. But you can just add all the herbs into one jar, cover it with olive oil, let it sit um, in a warm area of your house. So put it, if you're going to put it near a window, put a plastic bag over it so that it doesn't get light at, um, directly onto the herbs. Um, but we're getting that kind of passive heat. Or you can put it near a register and let that sit for about four weeks. And then you're going to press out your oil and then you're going to melt some beeswax into it. So with the blends, um, and you were saying that you usually do your all, all of your uh, herb infusions separately and then put them together, um, which when you're doing a large quantity, like I'm sure you are, that makes perfect sense. For most of us doing it at home, it probably makes more sense just to put all of the herbs that we're going to use in a jar with the olive oil and let that be our, our the base for our salve. Absolutely. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Mm hmm. Okay. Any other blends or? Oh, I like to always have like an antiseptic blend as well. So like an antiseptic salve, which would be, I would always have the cottonwood in there. Um, usually I'm doing calendula and I'll put a bit of tea tree or essential oil. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes I'll add something that's a little bit stronger in antimicrobial activity. So golden seal is one herb that I do use on rarely. So it is an endangered plant, but it is a really nice plant to include, especially if you're doing a lot of kind of back country or going in deep into the forest is to have something that's more stronger antimicrobial. It will turn your skin yellow though. So it does have a yellow um, constituent called berberine in it, which is what we're hoping to get out because that's the antimicrobial activity. Um, but it's not for an everyday use. So um, that would be more of a for someone who's going out more into the forest and uh, really wants to make sure they have something strongly antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. But that part, too, is that we're using a lot of resins um, for this antimicrobial activity. And I teach quite a bit um, of my students how to uh, when they're out in the forest, how to identify plants. Um, or different kind of constituents that they can use topically for uh, for wounds or for any kind of injury they had. And one of my favorite thing, things that I like to do is just using tree sap topically. So if there's a wound, I'll just go to a tree that is already has like a, a wound is dripping some sap, and I'll put that directly on my wound because that in itself is going to be antimicrobial. It will create a barrier for healing. Um, and for kind of that, so nothing kind of gets deeper into the wound. Um, and it's something that you can do when you're out in the forest. So I'm a, I'm the, the person who will definitely be using tree sap for numerous things um, in my practice and when I'm out in the forest as well. Oh, that is awesome, Krista. I had no idea. That would, if you're out taking a hike or a walk, whatever, in the woods and you get cut or scraped. So what you're saying is your first line of defense, especially you probably, most people probably don't have anything with them, especially if it's, you're not doing an overnight or, you know, you're just maybe taking a, a walk during the day, um, is to put some tree sap on it. Absolutely. And that kind of gets into using plants uh, topically in a, in a form called a poultice. Mm -hmm. so a poultice is where we actually take the plant material itself and we either chew it up with our mouth or we are going to um, kind of steep it with a little bit of warm water to really help the extraction of the plant constituents, the chemical makeup of the plant that we're using as medicine. Um, and I use poultices quite a bit um, on site. So that's one of my main on site applications. So if I cut myself, I'll find yarrow, chew it up, put yarrow directly on my wound, and it will stop bleeding quite quickly. Um, and I've become quite um, creative in my 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 out in the forest herbal medicine for for wounds and things. So um, I've used numerous things to help stop bleeding. So I've had I had this one injury where 
I was hiking and I wore sandals, which you probably shouldn't do. <laughs> Pretty bad um, wound on the bottom of my foot. And it was it was gushing blood. So I couldn't really walk around. And so I just had to sit down and reassess, you know, couldn't find yarrow. I couldn't find any of my normal plants that I use to stop bleeding. So plantain and usnea, but I found blackberry. So we have a trailing, uh, a, it's a uh, plant that is native to Vancouver Island, trailing blackberry. And it was growing right where I, I had sat down and I said, oh, I wonder if this would work. So I chewed it up and it's astringent, has quite a stringent kind of quality to it. So it has lots of tanniny kind of quality. And, and when you chew it, kind of like when you drink uh, black tea, it has lots of tannins, makes your mouth kind of go kind of puckering a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I chewed it up, put it on my wound. I took some grass and kind of weaved a, like a bandage together and it worked great. I was able to get out of the, the forest and stop my bleeding. And it had some antimicrobial activity as well that I, I with some other plants I use and my wound healed quite well. And, um, you know, I probably would have had to figure out other types of bandages with clothing if I didn't do that because I, I could not walk without blood coming out. So wow. <laughs> it's one of those, sit down and you have to do something about this wound. Well, you know what? If I want to go for on a camping trip out in the boonies, you would be the person I'd want to come with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I've been missing, you know, the, with the colder weather here, I find I usually do lots of winter camping and I haven't gone camping for like since November from that's that's a long time for me. So I, I'm itching to get back out in the forest. Mm-hmm. So herbs to be used as a styptic. What, what I what I would call a styptic um, hmm. uh, for for stopping blood, uh, yarrow, plantain, yes. yeah. um, and you're saying blackberry leaves work. Yeah, anything that has lots of astringent quality. But one of my favorites is making uh, a styptic powder. So it's using um, mm-hmm. it's using usnea, so that's old man's beard, plantain, and yarrow, and I just do equal parts and I blend it up into a powder. So I let it dry and then I powder it. And then I just carry a little um, kind of jar, like it's a very small jar, it's like a 30 mil jar around with me. And it is amazing. So I've even used it around home. So um, having like a shaving cut or anything like that, where it bleeds quite a lot, or if you're cooking, you cut yourself and you know, those bleeds that are just like, whoa, it's not stopping with a bandaid or pressure or anything that this, this styptic powder it stops it immediately. So I've had some really bad wounds where I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, pretty, you know, and it's not like I need to go to the hospital kind of wound, but it was just bleeding and bleeding through band-aids. And then I applied the styptic powder and it would stop immediately. So that's my favorite is usnea, plantain, and yarrow as a mixture. So just equal parts dried and then powdered. But then when I'm out in the field, anything that's astringent, so raspberry, blackberry, um, as those two plants that I typically use, if those other plants are around. Okay, great. So we've covered salves and poultices. What else do you have for us? I've got a feeling this is going to be maybe not just a check-in, but um, we'll turn into more than that. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, the next one that I do, I don't carry too many capsules around, but I do like capsules um, because it is a really nice vehicle to deliver herbs in a dry form. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's nice as a capsule is that you can take it internally but you can also open it and apply it topically. So it is kind of uh, useful in two different applications, so both internal and topical. And it is really nice to have capsules around for people who potentially can't take tinctures. So we'll talk about tinctures in a minute. Um, but some people might be um, ha- might have sensitivities to alcohol or they might have an addiction to alcohol and you don't know who you'll be with. So I always like to carry a few different capsule blends around. Um, But sometimes I like to keep my capsules more simple. So I usually will carry around slippery elm. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, slippery elm is an endangered plant. So if you you can use marshmallow root, it's more appropriate. But for what I'm looking for slippery elm for, I'm using it in very specific indications. Um, So I can open it and I can use it topically as a poultice and it's a drawing agent. So if I had um, a sliver or I I felt like there might have been something deeper in the skin, I can put that on topically and it can draw things out. You can also use clay in that same manner. Um, So I always carry lots of clays around as a drawing um, agent. Uh, But slippery elm is really good for that. And slippery elm is also really nice for digestive problems. So I can open it up and I can make a paste for someone who has heartburn 
or I can keep as a capsule for someone who is having more digestive uh, complaints in their intestines. So I can kind of use it in multi functions in a capsule form. Mm -hmm. I um, also didn't realize slippery elm was uh, on the endangered list. Oh yeah, absolutely. So hmm. using marshmallow is uh, marshmallow root has a lot of the same properties. Uh, slippery elm is stronger. So for my purposes, I typically carry slippery elm, but absolutely we can be using marshmallow root in a lot of the same instances. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one that I like to always carry around is cayenne. So uh, cayenne, you can take it internally. So say uh, you're out camping and someone injured themselves. When they go into shock, they often get quite cold. So we can take some cayenne to help warm them up. Or say someone just goes out camping and they're not used to that kind of weather and they get cold or damp or sick. We can be using cayenne to um, help warm up the system. But cayenne is also a really great, uh, it helps uh, loosen and thin mucus. So if someone has lots of congestion, so say that they're out camping or even at home and you can't breathe through your nose because you're so congested, you can be making a cayenne tea or be taking the cayenne capsules and it will, it will thin the mucus and it will allow you to move that mucus out of that congested area, allowing you to breathe better. So really nice um, for that congestion. So my favorite thing, um, if I'm sick and I can't breathe through my nose, is I'll go get really spicy soup and be eating my soup with a Kleenex in my other hand because I know my <laughs> nose will start running. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> thing that cayenne is good for, which most people don't know, and it, it's uh, definitely uh, a last case resort, but cayenne is also a styptic. So if you have a wound and it's bleeding, you can put cayenne directly into the wound and it will stop the bleeding. It will hurt, but it will stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's my what I usually carry around for capsules. But if I'm going to be out with people that I know can't handle alcohol or with people that I don't know very well, I'll carry a lot of the capsule blends around that I would make in my tinctures. So we'll talk about tinctures next. But again, if I don't have, um, if I don't know the people very well, I'll always bring more capsules with me just in case they aren't able to uh, uh, take any of the alcohol preparations that I usually carry around. Mm -hmm. Hold on just for a moment. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. We were just talking about uh, capsules and just moving on forward from uh, discussing about how I use capsules quite a bit for people with uh, sensitivity to alcohol because one of my main uses that I have in my herbal first aid kit is with tinctures, which is an alcohol-based extraction. Mm -hmm. um, so we can jump right into that if that sounds good. Awesome. Let's go. All right. So uh, again, there's a few simple tinctures that I like to provide. So again, a simple uh, herb is where we're just having one herb by itself. And I really like simples in a natural emergency medicine setting because you don't know if you need to give a lot of herb of that one herb to someone in an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. If it's in a formula, there might be other herbs that you can't increase in dose. So a classic example would be an immune tincture. So if I just have echinacea by itself, I can give high doses of echinacea to someone who is maybe feeling under the weather, maybe got exposed to something um, and are, are starting to feel sick, or even if they have a cut or we're worried about um, infection, if we increase echinacea, which is a really nice uh, herb to help with infection, it boosts your own immune system. So it'll help fight off anything that might be uh, growing. So infection in the skin, or if you're sick, we can go high dose of echinacea. Versus if I just had an immune formula, I might not be able to go high dose with all the herbs in there. So sometimes in my immune formula, I like to add things like elderberry, elderflower, which are really safe. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like to use cedar quite a bit as well. And cedar, mm -hmm. you can't do high doses of cedar um, because it's a bit um, hard on the liver. So if I had an immune formula and I had cedar with me, but someone wasn't feeling well or they had a really bad, um, you know, maybe they had a burn, which would be, you know, we want to make sure we're really boosting the immune system or even a really large cut. I can't do the high doses of the immune formula with cedar in it, but I can do with echinacea as a simple tincture. So that's one of my favorite to carry around for immune boosting, for 
any kind of infection, especially anything where there might be a burn involved, you really want to make sure that you're keeping that person really well hydrated and that you are in boosting their immune system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what I'm hearing you saying is that even though formulas are much easier, uh, it's simpler to take because everything's in it, um, it's really having the uh, the simple herbs or each individual herbs uh, separately will give you a lot more flexibility. Especially when you have to take high doses of that mm-hmm. herb. So echinacea, you actually have to take really high doses. So I often see people doing like an echinacea stragglers mix when they're not feeling well. And they're doing like drop dosing, like three drops or maybe half a dropper full. And when I'm not feeling well, I end up taking five mils and, you know, every like hour or so. So I tend up taking quite a bit. So you can go really high with echinacea and it's actually more effective if you go high doses mm-hmm. over a short period of time than just small amounts when you're sick. So you really want to make sure you go really high. Okay. And that's the angustifolia or the purpurea or both? Um, you could really use either. I prefer angustifolia. I find that it's a little bit stronger. Echinacea, just a side note though, too, is that it will tingle your tongue mm-hmm. and that's actually <laughs> the immune um, constituent. So it's a constituent oh. that um, is a chemical makeup of the, of the tincture um, that will make your tongue tingle. It only is an alcohol soluble constituent. So you only get it in a tincture. You won't get it into a tea very much. And that's what we're really looking for is that tingling on the tongue. But I always warn people because when I give them high doses, they think that they're having an allergic reaction because their mouth is tingly. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's a very normal reaction. So if you're looking for a high quality echinacea tincture, you want to find a tincture that makes your tongue tingle. And angustifolia tingles your tongue, I find, more than purpurea does. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that uh, an, uh, an, an echinacea tea probably isn't going to do much? Uh, it's still going to do some. It's just it's more potent and stronger in a tincture form. Okay. So there's constituents that are extracted in alcohol that will do better um, for the immune um, component if you do a tincture. But you can still do um, a tea with it. It's still going to be beneficial, for, especially for people who can't handle alcohol extractions. Mm-hmm. Um, but I find that overall, I prefer to give tincture with echinacea. Okay, great. I learned mm-hmm. something there. Thank you. Ah, absolutely. And then a few other simples that I like to carry around. So um, I I always like to carry around, uh, and this is a herb that is restricted in herbal medicine, which means that um, it has a very specific dose if you go too high. And in this case, if you go too high with this herb, it's just going to cause some anxiety and maybe hypertension. So increasing the heart rate, increasing the blood pressure. Um, and that's ephedra, but it's mm-hmm. really amazing for an asthma attack. So if someone's having an, some sort of asthma attack or any kind of bronchial constriction, um, we can be using ephedra to help with that bronchial constriction. And in some cases, it might be that they're having bronchial constriction where they need to go seek medical attention. Um, but ephedra might get them to the hospital or to go see um, a medical practitioner. Um, so I use ephedra. I always like to carry it around, but I always like to carry around um, Benadryl as well in case someone has an aller- allergic reaction mm-hmm. that's really strong. Mm-hmm. Um, so say they're allergic to uh, wasps and they get a, a wasp sting. I want to make sure that I have something that's going to really help get them to an emergency setting. And Benadryl um, if you don't have an EpiPen, Benadryl will at least give a little bit of time. It's still an emergency. Get them to the hospital. Um, but I find that those, you know, the, it's always nice just to have something along because you don't know if people are going to have an anaphylactic response to something. Benadryl, I want to note, though, it's not going to stop an anaphylactic response. It's going to slow it down. So you still have to absolutely get to the hospital, even if they say that they're feeling better. They might not notice what's happening in their system. So uh, you always Mm -hmm. want to make sure that you're being very, um, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So I'm always, you know, very much let's go to the hospital if you've had toxic exposure, if you've had, um, an, you know, allergic reaction to something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But on that side so note about toxic exposure is that if someone, say, ate um, something they shouldn't have eaten out in the wild, so, you know, they're, they're not good at identifying wild um, medicinals or wild mushrooms and they ate something and you're, you're questioning, you're going, I don't think that's what you think it is. And they might be having some sort of toxic exposure, especially with mushrooms. I always find you really want to make sure you can identify mushrooms. And you should never eat little brown mushrooms. They're really hard to identify little brown mushrooms. Mm. There's very specific mushrooms that are really easy to identify, but you should always know um, the the other lookalikes because there are some toxic lookalikes to even um, common, you know, mushrooms that people harvest. Mm -hmm. But 
if you're having toxic exposure, so you ate something that you shouldn't have um, because it was gone, you know, you're out camping and something was off and you ate it, or you ate something that you shouldn't have because you didn't identify it properly, um, dandelion root or milk thistle will again help you get to the hospital where, you know, it's going to at least decrease the toxic exposure for a period of time. I, it's not going to be strong enough that it's going to stop, especially if you eat like a poisonous mushroom, mm -hmm. you still want to go to the hospital. I really want to stress that, but at least these herbs are going to help you get to that place because you might be, you know, a little ways out in the woods and you still have to get to the car, get to the hospital. Um, and dandelion root is everywhere. So you can be eating, uh, just fine, dig up a dandelion and just chew it and, you know, get to the hospital if you ate something you shouldn't have eaten. Um, but it's also really good for any kind of food poisoning as well. But I'll talk about some other things I bring in my herbal first aid kit for food poisoning in particular. So don't worry about the dirt. <laughs> Just brush it mm. off as well as you can and start oh, chewing. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm all about the dirt. <laughs> yeah, I think the only mushroom I really trust myself with to find and, and use in my cooking is morels. <laughs> that, yeah. I've got, that one I've got down and we have a lot of Yeah, but there's there. a false morel, so you have to be careful with that one because it, it looks similar, but it's not a morel. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I like to carry around um, for allergies is my, I like to bring around Chinese skull cap, which it's different than the um, Western skull cap where it's, you know, where we have the skull cap herb growing. Mm -hmm. It's a Chinese skull cap where they're using the root and it's an amazing anti-allergic. It works immediately. So if you start, you know, for me, I, I'm not from Victoria originally. I'm actually from the prairies. And so moving to Victoria, I was like, oh, wow, cherry blossoms. Look at all these flowers. And as I'm sitting underneath a cherry tree, I'm like, what is this scratchiness? I've never had allergies before. Well, I'm allergic to cherry blossoms, which I didn't realize. And oh, so no. I that Chinese skull cap is uh, so amazing for um, an immediate relief. So if I start getting that itchy throat and kind of getting that closed off feeling in the back of my throat, if I take Chinese skull cap, it works immediately. Um, you can do a few other things too. So I like doing astragalus and reishi, but I find that you want to do a regus, astragalus and reishi combination, um, usually about... Uh, I would say like a month before the exposure happens. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know that I'm allergic to cherry blossoms and cherry blossoms are going to be coming out in March. So I should be taking my astragalus and uh, reishi combination every day to help prevent any allergic response that I have. Got it. And do you use that as a tincture? Yeah, I do use that as a tincture. I find for myself... I prefer tinctures because they're really quick and easy. I love herbal teas. I'm a, I, I'm definitely drink tons of herbal teas, but I find for um, therapeutics for myself, I'm more compliant if I take a tincture and I do that twice a day versus herbal teas. I switch every day. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have my holy basil and rose and I'm going to have my licorice and you know, something else like a Rudy tincture. So I switched my tea or sorry, my teas quite a bit. Um, and for tinctures, I find to get the actual dose that I need, I I end up taking um, a tincture. It's quick and easy. Pour into a little dosage cup and you're off and ready to go. Right. Well, I, I think it's pretty funny that, um, in fact, I don't think I've I've uploaded our uh, our talk on teas yet, uh, but you were talking about compliance with teas and <laughs> I was told recently to drink licorice tea every day and I thought, oh, easy, you know. <laughs> Well, guess what? I haven't uh -huh. been all that compliant. <laughs> no, I know. It's really tough actually to be compliant with teas. So I find that people are really good with them for like two weeks. And then after that, they just, they forget or they kind of get sick of the taste. And they're like, I just don't want to drink this much fluid versus a tincture. It's just like a, a really small amount that you just can put into water and you can drink really fast or you can just shoot the tincture straight. And so um, I just find that the dose is it's more potent in a smaller form mm -hmm. and that works for a lot of people and more consistent too I, i'm not really sure how you can be accurate with the uh dosage when you're drinking tea uh yeah it's harder to be um yeah it's harder to be accurate i find yeah um so i'll just jump into some tincture combinations too that i like to use so great um one thing that with tinctures is that all of the tinctures you are making or that you're bringing with you that you can take them internally. So you can take tinctures internally to help with any kind of therapeutics that you need, but tinctures can also be used topically. And when you use them topically, it's called a liniment. Mm -hmm. And so all you would just take is a cotton pad and you pour that tincture onto a cotton pad and apply it topically. So some of these tinctures that I'm going to talk about, um, you could use them topically as well. Um, one in particular would be the antiseptic tincture. 
Um, so in those, I like to use a lot of my antiseptic herbs. So I might use propolis, myrrh. I might use the cottonwood. So in the in the salve um, conversation, I talked a lot about uh, cottonwood and how it's one of my favorite um, cotton or so one of my favorite um, oils to make because it reminds me of home, but it's also very antiseptic. Um, you could also use golden seal. Um, you want to usually bring the stronger hitting herbs with you. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to use it for infection, you want to make sure that you're using strong herbs. But one thing to note is that golden seal is endangered, so we want to be careful about our overuse. So this is one area where I will bring it because it is very potent. But one thing to note too is that golden seal has a constituent called berberine and berberine uh, will stain your skin yellow uh, for a short period of time. But just so you know, when you put it on topically, it's going to stain your skin. Be careful if you have white clothes and you're pouring the tincture, you will get white clothes stained. It's it's the, the rule of tinctures that stain we always stain our clothes um at least if you're wearing white you can always use a little bleach to get it out exactly. Whereas with colors you can't do that <laughs> i know exactly um and so um i like to have an antiseptic tincture always with me because infection you know if you're out whether whether you're out hiking in the woods and you get a cut or you're at home and you got a cut or a burn infection is something that is in all applications so i find that i like to um, really have something that's antiseptic in a tincture form because we can take it internally, plus we can use it topically to help with infection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to add that um, I don't know if if this is something you teach, and I, for a lot of people, I know this is going to sound really weird, but um, our whole family does this for different things. And I have found that because your your own pee is sterile, and especially mm -hmm. if you're out in the in the woods or something, if um, and I've been finding that any stubborn skin rash or any any stubborn skin thing, if I put fresh sterile pee on it, it starts healing really really fast. Oh, interesting. I haven't used that before. I know with certain, um, oh, I forget what it is. If you get spit by something in the ocean. Um, oh, can, uh, uh, those jellyfish, jellyfish. The jellyfish, right. Yes, of course. The jellyfish, you can use your urine to help mm -hmm. uh, kind of, yeah, I'm not sure what, what the urine does in that case, but um, yeah, that's really interesting. I'll have to do more research onto that, but yeah, if in doubt or if you have nothing else, there we go. I mean, that's urine. something you've always got with you. Very, very true. Absolutely. Um, and so some other combination tinctures that I like to have is I usually like to have something that's going to be good for pain. So someone might have fallen and injured themselves, whether they're out again, out in the forest or at home. So I always like to have something that's a nice pain relief tincture. And I will send you a nice kind of outline of some herbs that I like to put into a uh, formula. So I'll get you a list of nice herbs. But um, in my pain relief, I usually like to do things uh, like Cori Dallas or Valerian. Um, sometimes I'll do um, things like Willow or Meadowsweet, which mm -hmm. have the aspirin-like constituent in it. So mm -hmm. it has a, a constituent called salicin, which it turns into salicylic acid at tissue sites. So whether there's inflammation, it will turn into the active anti-inflammatory constituent again, was called salicylic acid at tissue site. And mm -hmm. aspirin is acetyl acyl, salicylic acid. So acetyl salicylic acid is the same thing, but it's the active form um, when you're taking it internally, which is actually why people get um, irritated when they take aspirin is that it's in an acid form. Mm -hmm. And when they're putting an increase in acid into their stomach, it causes ulceration. So it causes bleeding in the digestive tract. So when we're taking Meadowsweet, or willow, it's getting activated at tissue site, which means that there's no digestive um, irritation. Interesting. And actually, I didn't know that. Yeah. And actually, meadowsweet, which has that salicin, which turns into an anti-inflammatory salicylic acid, is actually really good for ulcers. So if you've been taking aspirin because of pain and you're starting to get ulcers, you can start taking meadowsweet. It's going to heal the ulcer. And it's going to help with pain management with having an anti-inflammatory component. Wow. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I but, like that. Yeah. So it's always nice to have a pain relief. Um, one of my favorite kind of combinations I like to carry around is a peppermint spirit. Um, so this is peppermint essential oil. So this is the only essential oil that I actually consume um, internally. If you're going to consume other essential oils, you want to make sure that you talk to an aromatherapist. 
Uh, not all essential oils can be taken in chili. I, in fact, most can't. Um, but peppermint is really safe. Um, so I usually mix, mix um, a really small amount of peppermint essential oil, usually just a few drops, in with a peppermint tincture. And it's really good if there's any indigestion, so if there's gas or bloating. But I also find it's really nice. You can put it topically, and peppermint is going to have an analgesic effect. So mm -hmm. you can put it on for headaches, especially if you like cool with your headaches. So you can put it topically. You can also rub it on your belly as well to, if there's any kind of indigestion. So you can use this one topically as well. Mm -hmm. Just be careful and not get it too close to your eyes. <laughs> exactly. Don't get Thank you for that. Um, and then I also like to have an antispasmodic compound. So mm -hmm. I'll usually use things like cramp bark in there. Um, I might do some skull cap, maybe some wild yam, just any kind of spasm in the body. So this is going to be good for both skeletal spasm. So for skeletal muscles, which are muscles that I am, I'm thinking about moving and I'm moving and also our involuntary muscles. So muscles that I'm not thinking about that might spasm like mm -hmm. my intestines or in this case, cause I'm, I uh, have a uterus, my uterus. So if I'm having cramps around menstruation, I can take this herb for that time, but I can also use it if I have spasm in my back. So it's really nice for both spasms. So skeletal and uh, which we call smooth muscle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the States we say skeletal. <laughs> right. Oh, skeletal. Well, we I, had a big discussion about this because the kids were just learning uh, <laughs> about muscles. And I'm like, what are you, skeletal? I said, what, what, what are you talking about? What word is that? And then we figured out it was, I say skeletal, they say skeletal. So. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Um, it's also really nice to have um, some tinctures that are going to be a little bit, um, you know, for me, I do quite a bit of hiking and being out in the forest. And so I came across this one form that's called Life Drops. And mm. it really brings a life back into you. So it's 70% cayenne. Oh, it's wow. a lot of I know. Wow. And then there's 15% peppermint, a little bit Whoa. of cola, which is stimulating, some hawthorn berry and elderflower. And it's literally like if you are, you know, if you've got, you know, because there's lots of cayenne, we can be using it for multiple things. But um, if we're out and we're really cold because we, you know, couldn't get a fire going because the wood was all wet, you can use it for that to help kind of, you know, heat up the body. Um, it's also really good if you're in shock because it's going to help to bring warmth to the body. But it's also really nice if because it has so much cayenne that if there's any kind of congestion, so if you have a cold or flu and you've got quite a bit of mucus, you can also take some of this. And it's really, I would say, max three drops. It's not a lot. You don't take a lot of it. Um, but it, it immediately will help to thin the mucus. So I have I always like to carry it because I find that in a lot of cases, if you're feeling fatigued or if you're feeling under the weather, this her this this formula actually is just such a great combination. And could you tell us what the 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 list of what you have in it again, please? Yeah, I will definitely, and I'm going to send you guys the the link so that you can actually uh, download a copy of this PDF. But I seventy percent cayenne, fifteen percent peppermint, five percent cola, which is quite stimulating, five percent hawthorn berry, and five percent elderflower. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll have links on the on the podcast website for yeah. For I'll these definitely things. send you an update so you can download the PDF because it you know has all the formulas and different um, outline of all the the different tinctures and capsules and teas. Awesome, thank you so, so much. That's one of the, yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of the there's a few other um, combinations that I'll have on that PDF for you, but um, I find you know that's the main ones I like to carry around. So I always like to have an immune. Um, and asthma, allergies, and toxic exposure, and then something for infection and something for digestion. And then I like to carry around uh, the life drops because it's just such an invigorating. I'm a very, I'm, I'm a prayer girl that Victoria for me is really cold and down, but I like to, I have cold hands and feet quite a bit. So I find for me, if I'm out hiking for a long day and I'm getting really cold, the life drops just invigorates my system back up. Mm hmm. The kids should have had that on their on their outdoor winter yeah. camping trip last I think week. You got the natural emergency medicine kit for your kids when they're out in the woods. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. I've been thinking about that. Well, I'm thinking about kind of putting together some packages, so we'll have to talk. Yeah. Um, so then I have some essential oils. So that's kind of all I have for tinctures. And I like to carry around a few essential oils um, because they are really potent, um, you know, medications. They, all essential oils are going to be antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory. I don't like using essential oils too much because essential oils are very concentrated plant medicine. It takes a lot of plant material 
to make essential oils. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't really understand that when you're making any kind of essential oil or hydrosol about how much plant material goes into making these. So if you ever make essential oils, you'll be shocked at how much goes into for you know how much plant material you need to get just a small amount of essential oil. Mm -hmm. So I like to use essential oils in a very um, specific kind of therapeutic um, application, but I'm, I'm not... I'm not really big on using them in an everyday um, use or I'll dilute them down. Mm -hmm. But some of my favorite light I like to carry around is tea tree, lavender, and eucalyptus. Mm -hmm. And so tea tree is just such an amazing antiseptic. So you can put it, you know, you want to mix tea tree with something, a, a base oil, because it can actually be so strong that it can burn your skin. Mm -hmm. So you want to mix your essential oils with a base oil when you're applying it topically. Um, but tea tree is a, such a great antiseptic. So I love it for wound, um, any kind of infection. Lavender, I really like because it's really good for burns. Um, lavender is safe enough that you can put lavender directly on your skin, but you should always do a test patch before you put it on a large amount of area just because everyone has their own kind of sensitive, you know, sensitivity to certain things. And not everyone likes the smell of lavender. So for some people, lavender gives people a headache. So, you know, lavender we can use in the temples for headaches, but only if you like that herb. But I find that lavender is really good for any kind of stinging, any kind of burning sensation on the skin and burns as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing with lavender is that it's considered to be very balancing. So if mm. emotionally, if you're feeling down, it can lift you up. And if you're feeling wired, it can calm you. So, and I know um, lavender is also considered to be, you know, if you don't know what oil to use for something, go for lavender. And lavender, I will put directly on burns always. I, I've had some nasty mm -hmm. burns that have healed without any blistering just by putting lavender on. Yeah. And um, tea tree, just a note on tea tree, I will put drops of tea tree. If I'm starting to get a sore throat, a scratchy throat, I'll put a few drops of tea tree on my tongue and let it slide down into my throat and that usually will help me to avoid getting sick okay nice yeah I, I don't usually do tea tree internally for myself but I do sometimes oil of oregano but I find that people overdo oil of oregano and for me that's not it's not the best herb for me but um you know it's a strong potent herb so oh try, yeah you have to I mean oregano you've got to mix it with another oil tea tree you don't it's um tea tree's a lot easier to handle I think I've, I've been using tea tree for uh, throat stuff for years. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. I know it works great for gums and things like that. I just, mm -hmm. I, I always, you know, caution because people are, have their own kind of sensitivities that you just want to make sure they try one drop before taking five drops because then it, it might burn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what, yeah. And then one of my other favorite um, oils that I like to carry around is eucalyptus. And I really like that one for steam inhalations for lung problems. So if you are having congestion or having a hard time breathing or, you know, anything where you're feeling like you're under the weather, eucalyptus in a steam bath. So you would have a, a pot of, you know, quite, you know, boiled water that you pour into a bowl. You're going to add, I would just say one drop of eucalyptus. So try it first. And then you're going to take a blanket and then put your head over it and then inhale through your nose, inhale through your mouth because it's going to be antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And if you can handle that and you're not getting burning, then you can maybe add a couple more drops. But I always like to caution because everyone is, you know, some people are really sensitive. Some people can handle five drops. Some people can handle one. And I have had someone who took too much time one time in an essential oil form and they did the steam inhalation and they're like, oh, it's burning. And once it burns, you can't really un un undo burn. it. Yeah. <laughs> you can't undo it. You can't unburn it. And so I always caution that you start low and you can work your way up, but you can't work your way down. <laughs> Right. Um, and if you can get it, it's hard to find, um, but I find eucalyptus radiata is much better for inhaling. It doesn't burn um, and it's got a much more mild uh a sense it's it's much better for inhaling than the eucalyptus odorata or one of the others there's quite a few different varieties but the radiata is um is the one that i like to recommend for inhaling great yeah thank you for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I carry for my, my base essential oils. I also like to carry around some tea bags. So um, again, I don't use tea bags too much. Like I don't use capsules too often. I prefer to use tincture. But in some cases, a tea bag is so lovely. So I do like to carry around chamomile and peppermint tea bags. And, you know, if I'm working with people that I know have sensitivities to alcohol 
or, you know, just prefer to have teas, I'll carry more of those t- um, tincture formulas in a tea formula, but most I'm keeping um, tea bags on hand. Usually they're in a simple form, so it's just one herb, and it's usually in a t- already in a pre-made tea bag because it's, it's, you can use it for a few applications. So a tea bag, you can use it topically, just like you can use a tincture topically. When you use a tea topically, it's called a fomentation. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can make a tea and then we can dip a cloth into it and apply that cloth. But if it's also in a tea bag, it's almost kind of like a poultice where it's the plant material that you're directly putting onto the surface. Mm-hmm. So chamomile is so great for both, you know, as a tea, you can drink it for stress. You can drink it for insomnia, but topically with the tea bag, you can dampen it with a little bit of warm to to hot um, water, let it cool, and then you can put it on your eye for any kind of eye infection. You can also put it on the skin for any kind of inflammation. So I find it many kind of applications and peppermint is another one really great for indigestion, but I'll carry a lot more teas around if I may be working with uh, people that are sensitive to alcohol or have previously had an addiction to alcohol. Mm-hmm. I'll uh, carry a lot more teas around, but usually I just carry a couple of tea bags around and usually chamomile is one of my favorites, but you can also carry just a black tea bag around and black tea because it's high in a constituent called tannins, which when you drink black tea kind of makes your your mouth pucker a little bit and kind of kind of like wants to you know draw the tissue together in your mouth. Mm-hmm. It's going to do the same thing topically for wound healing. Mm. So if you have tannins um, in a black tea, you can use that tea bag topically to help heal wounds. So you can put it on topically and it's going to draw tissue together just like it draws tissue together in our mouth when we're drinking the black tea. Mm-hmm. So would you want to be careful then if it's a deep wound because you don't, you wouldn't want the wound to... Um uh mm-hmm. t- to heal uh on top without it healing underneath first yeah i find that comfrey does that more than black tea i find mm. black tea is going to help to just draw the tissue together um so that it can start to heal and it can start to uh f- you know kind of mend together so i find that comfrey is the one that i'm very careful for that okay. um but and that black tea or calendula is really safe. Um, it depends on the, how deep the wound is, but I find that you know black tea is also going to have some antiseptic quality. It's not very strong, but it's going to help to at least um, be a little bit antiseptic. So if all you have is a black tea bag on you, you can do a lot with black tea mm-hmm. bags. Cool. Mm-hmm. Who knew? And so that's kind of the, the wrap of everything that I carry around. So I always like to have some healing salves, some simple salves, so things for infection, bruising and skin healing like we talked about Mm -hmm. uh tinctures i always like to have something for digestion digestion immunity circulation which is that life drops something for antiseptic kind of something to help um any kind of infection pain relief and antispasmodic is my main kind of things i'm thinking about Mm -hmm. Uh, my tincture simples i like to think about immune asthma attack allergies and toxic exposures Mm -hmm. Capsules, I'm usually thinking about digestion and circulation. Um, Teas, I'm usually thinking about digestion, sleep, and infection. But again, if I'm working with someone who can't handle um, alcohol within the tinctures, I will bring a lot more capsules and a lot more teas with me um, to assist them if whatever kind of emergency situation arises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then essential oils are very much antimicrobial burns and respiratory tract is what I'm thinking of. So that's my, my main kind of uses for all those different types of herbal uh, preparations. Neat. Now I have a question for you, Krista. Mm-hmm. For people, have you thought about, because you've got, there's a lot of um, preparation that goes into putting this together and um, you have to have a source for all of the ingredients have you thought of putting together, or maybe you already do, uh, kits for people to purchase? I have thought a little bit about doing some kits. I haven't prepared anything yet, but I'm very open if people are interested in kits. I absolutely would love to make them up a kit. I did um, a few years ago for um, Christmas, I did a few kits for some um, some of my friends, just kind of some basic things that they could carry with them. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it's always nice to have something that is easy to access because in some areas it's hard to access herbs. I have a full dispensary that is really easy for me to make up all these different kind of kits. So that is something that I'm considering um, putting together. So if you're interested, I would love to pull together a kit and um, see what you would be interested in having in your kit. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Cause my thought is uh, 
that we we will uh, let's confer about what to put in it, and we can offer it on the podcast website. And oh, you can you can of course op- offer it too to your your people, but um, it'd be something that we could offer on the podcast website. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of add in a few other things. So, you know, obviously this herbal first aid kit doesn't replace your um, conventional first aid kit. So I always still carry bandages around and you know, I always like to have some alcohol antiseptic rubs and things like that. So it's nice to carry around um your traditional first aid kit. Um, I still will carry around some pharmaceuticals like Benadryl and, you know, an EpiPen, especially if someone has anaphylactic response to uh, a wasp thing or peanut butter or something of that sort. So I like to always have uh, all those cases covered. This is just kind of on top of what you want to um, carry with your standard. Mm -hmm. But there's a few other things I like to add into it as well. So I like to add candy ginger. So it's really great for any kind of nausea or indigestion. Also really good for circulation. So if you've got cold hands and feet, you can take some candy ginger. It's going to help to move, um, you know, blood around so that we can warm up our hands and feet. But it's also great anti-inflammatory. So I find mm. for that nausea, some people can't handle, you know, especially if they're in shock, Canny ginger has a little bit of that sugar, so it's going to be good to help to bring someone out of shock, but it's also going to be good to kind of suck on if there's any kind of digestive things that are happening. Yeah. Um, for that, on that topic about shock, there's two things I like to carry. So, you know, when someone injures themselves, you, you don't really know how um, bad it is because someone could be in shock and they might be just be like, oh, I'm fine. Yes, I fell down and, you know, my finger looks like it's bent or my, you know, my arm is broken, but I'm fine. They actually might be in shock. And so I always like to have um, these flower essence um, or homeopathics with, with me. So homeopathic and a flower essence is going to be an energetic dilution so it's the plant in an energetic dilution there's actually no plant material um, in the preparation it's very much energetic and my two favorite ones to carry around is i'll just carry bach uh, rescue remedy around mm-hmm. um, and i'll carry around arnica homeopathic arnica homeopathic is uh, very specific for trauma or for shock um, you can't do arnica internally um, but arnica homeopathic because there's no plant material in the actual preparation it's just an energetic dose um, is okay to do internally. And it's amazing for trauma or shock. Mm-hmm. I actually carry those two around myself. I keep them in my purse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so great. Um, and then I like to carry around electrolytes or if you can carry around coconut water or have coconut water at home. Um, if people are in shock or um, you know, if they've had digestive things happen or diarrhea or if they got sick and they are um, nauseous and potentially even vomiting, they are probably going to lose a lot of water. And I've actually had a situation where it was pretty scary. And this is when I didn't have electrolytes with me and I wish I did. Um, But I ended up camping, I was winter camping with a friend and he got really sick. So there was, um, I think this like a stomach flu that was going around. He got the stomach flu and we ran out of water, which Mm. is already really bad. And he was unable to walk out of the, we were pretty, you know, we were too far into the forest. It was probably about a 25 minute walk, but he was far enough that he couldn't walk out and was having a hard time carrying him. Oh my goodness. And he was having diarrhea and vomiting. So it was a really scary situation. And from there, I'm like, always make sure that you have, especially if you're winter camping or any kind of camping, you should have um, some sort of water filter so that you can actually pump water from a stream and and clean it. And then you should have electrolytes for people that are having, um, because you actually couldn't handle it. So what happens is he we ran out of water because he was trying to drink water and then it wouldn't sit well mm. and then he would end up you know moving it out of his body in one way or the other. Mm. Um, and so we just ran out of water that way and it was you know luckily he was fine and we got out and I we had water in the car so it was fine but um, you know for a period of time I was like wow this is scary I really wish I had extra water and extra electrolytes so I always just carry around an electrolyte packet when I am out hiking just because you never know when someone might not be feeling well and you need to add some more electrolytes into their water to help balance, um, balance their electrolytes. Now, what is an electrolyte packet? Um, electrolyte packet is just going to have the, uh, I'm not even sure what they have actually with the, you know, they're all going to be different. I have to look at my electrolyte packet to see what is in there, but it just helps to balance so that when you're drinking, um, water, it's mineralized. And so it's going to help with absorption of the water so that you're actually able to, um, intake the water into your cells. So it just helps to balance, um, your minerals and electrolytes. So it just helps to, to actually take in and hydrate your body. Mm -hmm. And where would you find something like that? You can find them at any health food store. And so, you know, there's a lot lot of like electrolyte 
drinks out there. So like Gatorade, Powerade, those are all electrolyte drinks that people are drinking after they've been working out because they're losing in their sweat, they're losing a lot of electrolytes. Mm -hmm. And it's a better way to hydrate instead of just water. It's actually better to take electrolytes with it because it helps with hydration. Mm -hmm. So you can find electrolyte water or electrolyte packets at any health food store, but you can also just carry on coconut water. Um, Coconut water is also going to be really great for helping with electrolyte balance. Mm -hmm. But if uh, weight and... um... Exactly. Is a concern, then the the idea of a packet sounds pretty good. Exactly. So it's a lot more lightweight than coconut water is. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, oh, no, yeah. no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know uh, when I watch the kids packing up all their gear for these out trips that they take, um, they probably don't want cans of coconut water. <laughs> no, no, no. Electrolyte packets are going to be a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I like to carry around is activated charcoal. So I was talking a little bit mm. um, about food poisoning and how I probably wouldn't do a tincture for food poisoning. Maybe, you know, if I, I don't have anything else, but I find activated charcoal to be the best. You can mix it with water. Um, it really helps with any kind of toxic exposure. So it binds to toxins um, and will kind of flush it out of the system. So I really like activated charcoal for toxic exposure um, and or for like food poisoning. So if you ate something that you shouldn't have eaten um, and it was off and you didn't realize it, activated charcoal is going to be um, such a savior. Okay. So how are you using this now? Is it in powder form? Are you putting it in water or something like that and drinking it? Yeah. So activated charcoal, you're going to get it into a powder form. Um, You can also do like um, topical applications. So if there's an infection or, um, even say that there is, um, and I use a little bit more with clay. So I like to carry clay around. Um, just like when we were talking about using slippery elm capsules topically to pull out, um, infection or pull out anything that's in the skin. So maybe you got a sliver clay will do that. And same with activated charcoal, more so clay though. Um, but you can use it topically. You can mix it into a paste, put it on topically for infection. But for the, in terms of trying to drinking it, I would just stir the powder into a glass of water and have them drink that. Um, okay. and that will help to, you know, especially if they had something that they shouldn't have had, that's going to help me get them to an emergency setting. So mm-hmm. in case I need to get them to the hospital or go see a medical professional, um, it's going to help to get them to that setting. So where would they find activated charcoal? You're going to find this at any health food store. Um, I find that it's pretty easy to find. It's pretty common nowadays. People really, uh, yeah, there's a lot of applications for it. So I find health food stores, um, potentially even like a vitamin mineral shop is going to have it as well. Okay. Now when in drinking it, is, uh, is it pulling, is it just pulling, pulling the, uh, uh, the toxins out of the system or is it causing you to vomit or how, how does it's, it work? It's pulling the toxins out of the system. So okay. it's, uh, it's kind of, it's in this activated form that it actually draws toxins to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's going to decrease the toxic exposure that you're going to experience. And how much would you ingest in the glass of water? Um, I probably put like a teaspoon, teaspoon in per glass of water. I think that would probably be good. I think okay. it would depend on how the dose. It probably will say on the side about how much to use it. But there's a lot of people that are using activated charcoal for masks and for things for even toothpaste. I've seen some activated charcoal toothpaste that's going to help to kind of pull toxins out of the teeth um, and make the teeth a little bit whiter. So there's a lot of applications for it. So I, I would just depend on your type of activated charcoal. But I, the one that I have, I usually put about a teaspoon per glass of water. Mm-hmm. Cool. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And that's kind of everything. We already talked about honey. I definitely want to carry raw honey around, so it's really great antimicrobial. And that's usually everything that I carry on top of my herbal um, first aid kit and then on top of my my standard first aid kit with bandages and antiseptic um, kind of pharmaceutical things that I might carry as well or Benadryl, things like that. So mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of everything I carry in my, my herbal first aid kit. Okay, Krista, I have to ask, how much room does all this take? Well, it really depends. So if you can get it into, you know, there's some cases where you can get it into like a smaller container. So I have some where I've kind of like, I've made it, you know, I've kind of picked the key things that I need. So I don't have everything that I talked about, Mm -hmm. but I'll have the key things that I have. And that will kind of fit into like, um, almost like kind of like a makeup container. So it's not really that big, like a Mm -hmm. kind of a zip makeup container. Um, but then I have a larger version that, um, would be a little bit more space, but then there's some people that do emergency first aid and they carry quite a bit around. So it really depends on how, uh, much you kind of feel like you will do. It depends on how long I'm going to go for. 
at home, I have more of an extensive one. And then when I go and I'm hiking, I have quite a bit of a pared down um, kind of emergency first aid kit. So it's really depends on the, on, you know, how far am I hiking? Can I carry a lot of fluid? Um, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Wow. Well, this has been awesome. I'm so glad oh, you thought pleasure. to do this. Uh, and I really hope that everyone takes, I'm sure that everyone can take something away, a takeaway from this, because even if you're not into hiking in the woods, just to have at home, um, some basic herbal first aid is I think really important. And, uh, you've given everyone so much information to work with here. Oh, great. Well, my pleasure. I'm glad to, to share, especially with, you know, herbal first aid kit. I think it's really important and valuable that people know some alternatives because a lot of people just don't carry anything. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Maybe that time that you don't have anything that something big is going to happen and you're going to, oh, I wish I had known about this situation. So it's my pleasure to share um, what I know on natural emergency medicine. And I really would uh, like to encourage the listeners to, uh, if you have, if you're interested in Krista putting together some types of kits, first aid kits, um, on the podcast website, realjanine.com, you can leave comments now. And um, please, please leave comments and let us know what you'd like to see, because if there's a desire and a need, we'll be happy to work on fulfilling it for you. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I would love to do some custom um, herbal first aid kits. So, you know, everyone has a bit of a different um, application than what they're using. Some people are at home. Some people want to have a bit more of like a forest emergency medicine, um, you know, kit with them. Mm-hmm. And so I'm definitely open to having um, a bit of a, you know, I'm looking for these kind of essentials in my herbal first aid kit. And I can kind of pull something that would be unique for what your situation is. So I'm really open to that and uh, we can move forward from that. So they can email me at clinic at chrisadonpolton.com, make a comment again on your website and we can move forward from there. So um, I'm definitely open to having a standard herbal first aid kit that I'm going to make, but I'm also open to some variations depending on your circumstance that you're hoping to use it in. Great. Well, thank you so much, Krista. This has been wonderful as always. My pleasure. Okay. So until next time, everyone, be well. Thank you, Krista. Krista Poulton is a regular guest on Keeping It Real with Janine. I appreciate her generously sharing her valuable knowledge with us. The next podcast episode will be available April 2nd. The topic is glyphosate. This may be the first time you've heard of the word glyphosate. It's the main ingredient in the herbicide Roundup that is used in GMO crops. What most people don't know is that it's also used on non-organic and non-GMO grains. You will hear from a very experienced organic farmer who will also talk about how the farming of grains has changed over the years, contributing to the current rampant gluten sensitivity. Part two of the podcast features a conversation with a functional medicine doctor who explains how the gut microbiome and our immune systems are affected by glyphosate. Not to be missed, as we all need to be able to make informed choices in our nutrition and health care. I will be posting a well-researched article by Dr. Jean DeBrant on the podcast website, too. Listen to or download podcast episodes and read blog articles at the podcast website, www.realjanine.com. And Janine is spelled J-A-N-E-A-N. Think Jane Ann, if that helps. You can leave comments and subscribe to the podcast to receive notice of new episodes and posts. Take care and be well.